Thank you, people. All right. Um, Slide show us up. See, yes. Black people create employment. I need someone just to flip my slides. Excellent. So, I guess uh, I'll give you guys like a two minute background of myself and why, well, assistive technology matters to me so much. It's not part of the presentation. You will not be quizzed. Um, I lost my sight at age five. Um, I'm doubly disabled. A, I'm blind, and B, I'm an Icelander. <laughs> and uh, I actually first, uh, my first encounter with a computer was I was 13 or 14. A computer with a braille display. It was uh, a couple of days long course. Didn't understand anything, but the nerd in me awoke back then, so I started learning DOS scripting and batch files. So it was in 94, 95. Um, Shortly after I got involved in the internet relay chat, well, the good old Irk, I don't think it was old enough to remember those things. So, um, I became friends with a bunch of people uh, among other places from the US, and I got this crazy suggestion from some uh, friend of mine on the internet that was just applying to university in the US because I don't know, I could do it. And I was thinking, oh, this is crazy, it's impossible. So. Well, I applied because of computers. I was inspired by this. I was inspired by people elsewhere in the world. Computers actually helped me get good grades. I learned pretty fast. Again, using computers, I owe everything to assistive technologies. I made it into Yale University in 1998, graduated four years later, and did a lot of programming for investment banks. But after I put two big banks out of business, well, Wachovia was one of them. Uh, some people say it was CEO's fault, but I'm claiming the other. <laughs> I decided to turn my uh, turn my kind of passion towards no, my work towards something I was passionate about, which is accessibility and providing these incredible opportunities that technology and access to technology and information provided myself. So I am very inspired. I recently joined VQ and I'm very passionate about the work we're doing here. I'd also would like to apologize that I have not been present, but that is entirely due to the fact that a lot of people want their accessibility fixed. And we are working long hours, but those are happy hours. All right, enough about myself. So, yep, first slide. Awesome. Bit of a nerd. If anyone knows, this is a chapter title from The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> That's, okay, what is the screen here? This could be a whole other session in itself. Now what screen readers do is they take information from the computer. Sometimes it's from the operating system, from sometimes directly from applications. It depends kind of on which application it is and to what extent it is accessible. It turns this information into speech. So it linearizes the information, presents it as a speech to the user. It can also work with a Braille display, which turns one line of text into Braille, the line of the current focus, it's often used in combination with screen magnifying software or even with uh, speech recognition. And uh, I don't want to get into technical details, so it kind of bore most people, I think. The important thing when it comes to websites, it always looks at the content. It reads the content in the order of the, well, reads the web page in the order of the underlying content. So if the web page uses CSS or other display tricks to visually make sense to the user, Someone who just reads the content still doesn't understand it. The screen reader is not going to tell you there's this menu on the left side or there's this thing in the middle. It kind of presents my page in an entirely different way. I know this is difficult to get into or get used to as a sighted user, but we'll see how screen readers can actually make up for that. So, sorry about that. Yeah. To help you browse websites with the lights on. It's important. <coughs> so where can I find screen readers? Well, basically this is a quick overview of the names of the terms you're going to hear. The most popular one is job access with speech or JAWS. The sharks are optional. Why the logo is a shark? I, I have no idea. And I really wanted to play the music for the movie Sharks JAWS here, but this is the most popular screen reader. It 
was very dominating until very recently, two or three years ago. So it has a large user base. You are very likely to encounter a lot of JAWS users. The problem with it from a testing perspective is it is expensive, $900-ish, the retail copy. It requires system admin rights on your system and this is going away, but it used to be true that it could destabilize your system due to the way it works with the Windows display drivers. Nevertheless, I'm using it right now, for example, for myself because it works better with proprietary things like Excel and PowerPoint than other screen readers. So, it doesn't work well enough, I have to <coughs> hit the space bar three times to get to the next slide. So, we are on to the next slide right now. Yeah, it works best with IE. It was kind of optimized for Microsoft, and there's been a lot of collaboration. So, my favorite, oh well, the one I recommend to you for your testing is NVDA. Not to be confused with NVIDIA. This happens all the time. This is actually two blind guys who are computer students in uh, computer science students in Australia decided to make a screen reader because JAWS was so bloody expensive. Do something about it. They started out, it was, you know, started very slowly, small scale. All of a sudden, they got interest, got sponsored by Mozilla Foundation, Adobe, Microsoft, and other big ticket companies. And now this screen reader is open source, it's free, it's very powerful. And yeah, you can run it directly from a USB stick. It doesn't require system admin privileges. And one thing it does, which is good for you, is it sticks very closely to standards. JAWS, for example, if there's a missing label or something is coded incorrectly, JAWS tries to guess its meaning from the surrounding content, which sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't, but it can confuse people who are testing their sites for accessibility. to the next one. There is a lot of other ones out there. Window Eyes is, well, it's about 10% of users use it. It had some issues with the web but until recently. For example, it did not support ARIA and ARIA landmarks until version 8. So if you have legacy users with Window Eyes, there might be some problems. This is true for JAWS as well. So. Even with your best efforts, you're always going to get some users who haven't upgraded and are, have issues. But, you know, the nature of accessibility is such that developers can only do so much. Then it's up to the screen reader and then up to the user to use the information. The other screen reader that I like and you can do for a quick testing is System Access and System Access to Go. For System Access to Go, you just go to the website satago.com. Always sounds like a Japanese curse word to me. Psycho. <laughs> and you are prompted immediately what you need to do to get it talking. And then it works not just with your browser, but it works with other applications on your Windows. So this is, you know, all you need is an internet connection, and you may want to try this out. It's not as accurate as MVDA with the complicated markup, but it is definitely a cool addition to the whole selection we have here. Yes, what about Chromebooks? You've probably heard of Chromebooks. So, it is work in progress. Is it as an extension to the Chrome browser? And that's basically it's the extension of functionality, at least on the Windows operating system. And uh, its use is very minimal so far. And yes, I have a question. How many out of the uh, 1,700 or so users the WebM survey reported using Chromebooks? Well done. <laughs> I'm not one of them. <laughs> I, I applaud Google's efforts, and I think it's a double kind of approach, but in terms of this as a testing tool, it is not going to be the tool that most of the users are using today. Of course, the landscape changes constantly, so be on the lookout, but you know, just so you know, if people mention Chromebox, it is hardly used at this point. And yeah, narrator for Windows is hmm, a bit of a joke. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sometimes I'm politically incorrect. But, uh, you know, it helps.
helps get other Windows screen readers up and running, and that's its purpose, and that's fine. So, well, take a bite of the Big Apple. VoiceOver is a good screen reader. It works a little bit differently from the other ones, and I'm kind of leaving it out for this presentation. It is a whole kind of different approach in itself, but it shares most of the characteristics. So if you're used to working on OS X, you have a MacBook, this is a good screen reader, you can fire it up right away. And yeah, which browser is it optimized for? I'll leave that to you. It's probably not Chrome.
The general handling scheme is just the H key. So you open your website with a screen reader, say MEDA. You want to see what is the next heading, press H. Screen reader will jump to the next heading, tell you what it is and what level. So it will say heading level 1, heading level 2, heading level 3. If you want to jump directly to the heading of a specific level, for example, when you are on a site and you're expecting the page to have a main focus, for example, you click on a news story on a website. Now, what you want is to read the news story. You expect that to be the main focal, focal point of the website, of the web page, that you opened. <laughs> you usually try, one, to go to the H1 heading, because you expect it to be marked as an H1 heading, being the focal point of the site. This is very important. So, T will jump between tables, if you have tables on the website. And we will get to the tables in a second. You can navigate within tables. And I will show you this very shortly, what I'm talking about. L will jump to the next list. So this is ordered an ordered definition. It doesn't matter. Within the list, you can use the I key to jump between the list elements. F will jump to the next form field. A form field is basically a selection of a bunch of fields, buttons, input fields, checkboxes, radio buttons, all of these are classified as a form field, basically any field you're unlikely to have to interact with as a user. So it's very convenient for you to open a website, you expect a form, you expect to have to fill in some information, so you just keep pressing the F key to see what is the next field on the page you have to interact with. If you press shift for the other keys I mentioned, you'll go to in reverse order, so you know, from the top to the bottom. So again, I know this is a bit overwhelming. You don't have to memorize all of these things. But just looking at this, you can go directly to the next visited link. You can go to the unvisited link. You can go between frames. You can go to the next landmark region. We've been talking about AR landmarks a lot here, and they are very neat. Just to go back to the H1 heading I was talking about before, you might not be able to use an H1 heading to mark the main section of a page for whatever reason. You can do that by just wrapping it in sedative and marking it with role equals main. Then I can go look for the main landmark in my screen reader. This is pretty convenient. I'll show this to you in a second using a typical Google search. And just that, uh, kind of as a note, there are two things that you do to this information to make it accessible on the website. And uh, does anyone kind of guess what I'm getting at? Table. Table is one way. Another way that I think would be a better is headings, because form fields, under form fields, I have a bunch of things that belong to a form field. So to mark that for non visually for the user, form fields should be a heading. Then everything that belongs to a form field should be set, put inside an ordered list. That way it's clear that if I see B for a button, it is part of the four fields. This is very important. <laughs> yeah, well, we have a little. Yeah, well, I like let's have them. So, stay away to heading. I don't know, it sounds good. So we're getting close to, I believe, me demoing screen readers a little bit for you guys. The last note of headings before I get into that. H, the H key jumps to the next heading of any level. But if you look for a heading of a specific level, it's going to keep looking from where you are until it finds that level or its parent heading. So if you start your page with an H2, then you have an H1 further down the page, and then another H2. If you're at the top, you press 2, it's going to tell you no more headings on this level. What it did, it searched and said, oh, so where's the next H2 or something that is H1? Oh, I see an H1, so this is the section of the website I'm looking at. So this is not overly important to you for design purposes, but just to be aware of it, if you start testing with headings, you have an H2, H1, and an H2 below it. You press 2 when you go, hey, 
this reader sucks. It doesn't find the second heading. It's still having a put in there. What's wrong with this chunk? But uh, it's actually logical. <coughs> All right. So I guess uh, I'll bring this up for a little screen and demonstration. Are you guys ready? Yes. All right. Fans in the audience? No? Yeah. Well, if you watched TV last night, you will hate me, but I lived in Carolina for seven years. <laughs> we hate the caps because I always lose to them, but what happened last night? <laughs> let's, go, let's go find out. Well, 
actually inspired my uh, question was a story I heard of in PR. Uh, supposedly, like, my boy <coughs> hustler, but they, they actually put out audio uh, edition for blind people. Yeah. And what they do is they actually hire people to read the picture creatively, like describe what, what is a picture look like. So, but when I look at the uh, you know the web the screen reader, it's so mechanical and linear. It just reads the text. It doesn't tell the, uh, the draw, uh, visitor you know what this page is like. Yeah, I personally this is this is one of my kind of dreams of developer to get into because I believe that screen readers should do more of that. That information is to a large extent available. So. Uh, you know, it, it hasn't gotten there yet. A lot of people that are that are born blind, you know, well, they don't like to make generalizations, but a lot of people are uncomfortable with trying to think of things in a visual perspective, like a layout. I had sight for five years myself, so I always visualize things. But some people like like it when the content is completely separated from the presentation, so much so that they don't even know if things are visible on the page or not. I think that creates a disconnect. Often, especially say a blind person is calling a sighted customer representative. So I think, and I hope we can kind of get more of this information into screen readers and get users a better feel for how they look. Okay. And the other thing that is happening right now is the invention of evolution of the touchscreen. That is absolutely brilliant. Because then you can explore the page with your fingers and then you kind of get a feel for the layout. So the touchscreen thing is really revolutionizing the way we interact with websites in many ways. So that's going to be, say, next year's presentation for sure. NHL.com dash stores. All right. NHL.com dash stores. Ah. <laughs> so now I, I know this website, of course. Oh, but I never checked it at work. I don't know why it's in my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we work hard, but we gotta get our short breaks. So I know that the game scores are set up into tables. So I'll look for the next table by pressing T. Table with six columns and three rows, column one, column row one, final. Of course the problem with this is what I should be able to do would be to press H and above each table there should be a header with the game, which teams are playing. Either the header or the table should have a caption, more descriptive caption or a summary. Final doesn't really help me very much. But I know this is the third game, but I did my homework. Table with six columns and three rows. Column one, column table with six columns and so, three rows. So here I'm on the right table. So this is what happens if you just, you're at the beginning of the table, you read it with the arrow keys in your typical forms, like just using the arrow key. First, second, third, T. Link point, left parent, zero, right parent. One, zero. Hmm. Wonder what team that is. Yes, this page has not gone through an accessibility certification. Link pair lineup. Zero, two, one, three. Link point left pair zero right pair. Link Washington. One, one, zero, two. Table end. Based on this, do you guys think you can tell me how many goals Carolina scored in the third period? Probably not, right? <laughs> now, the beauty of the table navigation keys, this table is, for the most part, accessibly marked up. So. I can use the control and the alt key with the arrow keys to explore column to the left, column to the right, rows up and down. Let's go back to the table. Say first, final. Final, for the Panthers, for the Panthers. For the Panthers, for the Panthers. There are no tables on this page, period. For the Panthers. Link, link graphic pictures, NHL.com dash source, English link. NHL, table with table with table with. Sorry. Link point left parent zero, right parent, row two. So, this is the column, row two. It tells you it's row two. Final link there, line of column two. First, zero, column three. So it tells you first, zero. Zero goals in the first period. Second, two, column four. Second, two. Third, one, column Third, five. One. T3, column 6. T3. This is because it's reading the, the column headers that are marked up as THs. And all this gives it the context. Set for five, five, that what it doesn't do five, first. is K1, 
Carolina and Washington should be marked up as row headings, so I could always tell. But now I'm in a column. One, row three, zero, row two. I'm not sure who scored, who scored one or zero. I have to go back to the beginning of the row to see that. Flag, flag, three, flag, left, there is flag, link, Carolina, column two. First, zero, column three, flag. Oh, okay. Link, Washington, row three, first, one, column three. So this is the importance of using column headers and row headers. It always, the screen reader is always going to give you the context of each table cell, and then you know the information necessary to interpret the data that you're looking at. So we go to <coughs> another example. Control L, address it, search, double, 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 period, G, O, O, G, L, E, period, C, O, M, enter. Google, void, left, parent, zero, right, parent, link, press enter for forms, both, search, edit. Right, so it tells me, this is Google, it puts my focus in the search box, so it tells me it's an edit. So let's go to that. Google. So, this is Google. You really say like homepage Google or something, but it doesn't. I want to look for something. Uh, do you guys have a phrase that's good for? Me? How about Aria? Ah, I'll look for jQuery. That makes more sense. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can look for trackers. There you go. Yeah. That's the yeah. Okay, so now I was told there's an edit field. It's an edit field. So I know that's a me. If it's correct. Search edit. It's marked up, it's labeled search. That's what Josh says. Search edit. So I know what edit field does. Enter. So I'm gonna get into this slightly later. You have to go into a different mode it's called interactive mode or forms mode. That way you can you stop using your keyboard to find elements on the page instead of using the keyboard for typing something. T R U C K E R S. Is the get back? I do tap. Tap. Reach a Google search button. Oh. I don't know why there's a region there. Enter. Threadverse dash Google search. Threadverse dash Google search. Threadverse dash Google search. Page has three regions, comma, 19 headings and 65 links. Three regions, 19 headings and 65 links. Interesting. So, again, how do you use semantic markup to basically. How should I be able to find the second result in the search results list? Let's imagine I don't know any of these shortcuts, so I'm going to do this using the arrow down key. Link plus burger. Link collects as pop up apps. Link collects as pop up 100 notifications. One. Link collects as pop up share. Link collects as pop up burger gun bus. Left parent burger dot gun bus and at gmail dot com right parent. Link times. Link times. Link. Link. Welcome to the new day of your favorite Google products, period. Link. Click the grid and have a look, period. This will take a while. <laughs> Not very efficient. Threat was national. So let's check the headings. Check the HP. Search results heading level 2. Ooh, that's interesting. Search results and level 2 heading. News for threat heading level 3 link. News for truckers. Part of the search results. Makes sense. Threat was apostrophe only protest apostrophe art does bother out capital heading level 3 link. List of one items nesting level one period. Edit level three link Trevor's apostrophe. Trevor's apostrophe only protest apostrophe art does not around capital edit level three link. So this is how you navigate my headings. Trevor's national. So that's pretty efficient. Let's try the landmarks. The area landmarks. I'm sure you've been talking about the last couple of days. So in JOS, this is a semicolon key. In MDA, this is the D key. Navigation region. Navigation region. And for navigation, I would expect kind of a sideway list of links. Main region. Ah, main region. This is the main part of the page. What is it? Related searches colon. Link Threaders forum. Link Threaders games. Link. So, starts with related searches. Link related searches colon. Alt tab. Task switching list box. Alt tab. PowerPoint slide. Alt tab. Screen resolution. Alt tab. Jaws. Jaws. Slow down for the... Alt menu. Menu. Options menu. Basics dot 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 to be. Voices. Basics dot 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 to be. Voices up menu, enter, voice adjustment, dot, 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 to me. Enter, leaving menus, voice adjustment, dialog, profile, profile, name, tab, profile, tab, synthesis, tab, synthesis, tab, voice adjust, colon, combo box, all content, tab, voice, rate, colon, 70, 30, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 10 percent. How about that? <laughs> Jaws, all tab, drivers, dash. It types, it, it tells me what I'm doing on the keyboard, so that's why you hear all these things, I'll tap. Now I go to the top of the page, control, home. 
reverse-google search. And so, so now use the semicolon key to explore the region. Navigation region. What is that? Web. Link images. Link maps. Link shopping. <coughs> link news. That's what I expect. Main region. It's the main region. So that should contain the main content of the page. I did a search for truckers, so that should be the search results. Related searches colon, link truckers forum, link truckers games, blank. Heading level two search results. This is good. So the main content told me there's a couple of related things, related searches I could be interested in. It's not quite the main thing, so you see it first and then you see a heading that marks the actual search results. List of 11 items. So because it's in a list, the screen reader tells me how many items I have in the list. 11 items, good. What do I do now? I'm inside a list. The nice thing about lists is you can <coughs> jump between list items using the I because it's an item. One period, heading level three link news for truckers. New list, one period, heading level three link truckers apostrophe only protest apostrophe on list, one period. Interesting. It's a new list because the list of Fox list. News dash 12. This actually be a good way they do this. List at nested level one. This is a problem with nested lists with just one item, so it kind of breaks the navigation flow. Two period. So let's jump. List because it's a nested list, it didn't work for me because it looked for the next list item, so wait a minute, there's no other list item. There's a whole new list. So just jump to the top of the page saying, no, you don't have anything. Two period list so, item. Yeah, now you have to use the arrow keys to read like one by one list of one. This is where you were before. One period. Link truckers plan to clog capital beltway Friday to protest government apostrophe corruption apostrophe. <laughs> Box news dash 12 hours ago. Uh -huh. That's today, by the way. <laughs> list at, yeah, uh, you're going to stay here all night, folks. One list at best able to period. Heading level three link is truckers apostrophe beltway protest on. Now we're on the second item, so let's try to use the I, I again to get to the third. Three period, heading level three link trucker protest. Nice, of course. Four period, heading level three link. So I say, oh, I wanted to read number two. All I have to do is to shift I. Three period, heading level three link truck. Two period, heading level three link is trucker's apostrophe. And as you guys may have noticed, it says heading level two. So I could have done this. Sorry, maybe heading level three. Let's see again. Two period, heading level three link is trucker's apostrophe built with. So it's heading level three. I could have reached this information now two ways, using the I shortcut key or the H, or three. You could use all three of them. Sometimes semantic markup, markup gets a little bit too much, but this is nice because it gives the user a bit of a choice how to reach the important parts of the work. <coughs> this is very good. It's quite cool. All right. Let's see, go back to my part for the ribbon. You guys need a little break. Break from the screen reader. <laughs> Not break from me yet. Yeah. I just need to put it in the navigation. Also, I'll make sure I'm not running way over time with you guys. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to be quick with this, the rest of this one. Yeah. 
Yeah, it doesn't have any of the speakers anymore. Yeah, did you hear it? Yeah. yeah, it is pretty fast. I, I know it sounds completely unintelligible, but so does Spanish to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it says more about me than about Spanish. So, yeah, tables, slide 13. I've kind of showed you this already, and I hope you kind of got the idea. I do a couple of recommendations here for screen reader consideration. Try to avoid tables for layout, if possible. You can mark them as strictly layout tables by setting the ARIA role equals presentation. This is another magic ARIA trick. But also make sure that they don't have any headings, they don't have any captions, they don't have a summary. The screen reader see those and go, oh, wait a minute, this is actually a table. So avoid them when possible. They create a lot of clutter and get the, make the reading more complex. If it's data table, make sure you mark up the columns and the rows when possible. You may want to use captions or summary. Like you guys heard before, when I press T with my jaws, it says table with two columns and three rows. That doesn't really tell me much. If you have the table summary and or the caption, and I better press the T, it tells me table. It reads the summary, it reads the caption, and then it tells you three columns, two rows. This is very important. So what I can always do is to press T. It says tables with X columns, X rows. Then I use the arrow key to go up and try to look at what is before the table in the content order. So you go arrow up, bar up, and see, oh, this game, okay. Then I go back down, and then I have to start from scratch. So it's a, it's a big time waster. It is still it is doable, it's just not very accessible. And again, if you have to use the L table, please make sure it makes sense when you read it out of order, i.e. linearly, from left to right. Another problem with tables, well, but get the data tables, sorry. Actual data tables. What is the problem, and it's kind of partially a screen reader problem, is table cells that span multiple rows and columns. It kind of really messes up the navigation order, especially when some cells in the table span two rows and columns, other cells do not. So again, I'm not saying don't use it, but just kind of be aware that it can cause a lot of confusion for users. So if it's possible to avoid that, it's a good thing. And we move on. Yeah, again, like you heard, screen readers know how many rows and columns are on a table. They do this for this too. This is very nice that they tell the user, and the user expects now knows this is a table of X columns and rows, knows where to look. This is very helpful. So, quick list of other navigational elements. You guys can look at that just on your own time when you get a copy. Sit down with MDA, play around with them, press the keys, and just kind of see where it takes you. Of course, all of this is dependent, depending on you, to provide the semantic navigation elements on the page. This is very important. For a page that, say, has no headers, no tables, no nothing, just data, all of these are completely useless. So this is kind of where you come in and the people that create the websites and the CMS, this is where it comes in to make sure there's some structure that people can use to navigate your site. And now we go into interactive mode. We don't have much time to cover it, it's a little bit more advanced. But the, the idea is what I kind of showed you before. When you get into a field where you have to provide input, the website expects the input from you. You have to be able to use your keyboard. So the screen reader switches. Some do it automatically for some it's a setting. VoiceOver does it a little differently. You have to interact with the field. But you have to basically tell the website, hey, now I'm going to use the, well, your screen reader. I'm going to use the keyboard to input information to the website. <coughs> Don't take my keyboard input and interpret it as something. It's going straight through to the website. This is important. 
This helps users fire off keyboard events, unfocus, on blur, all of these things. And if you have, you know, interpreted things like, you know, something tool tips that happen on, on focus, that's cool. If, for example, you want to check menu, do not initiate it when user is selecting the choice inside the check menu. So when the focus comes on the moves to the option that the thing the user wants to activate, you have to activate it when the user presses the tab key to tap away from the option field. User has then explored all the options available, has decided I want this, presses tab to move on. This is where you can update. So I'm not going to show you an example of this because we're not time, unfortunately. Maybe in general we can do like a more enhanced version of this or separate. But this is very important. And another thing that I kind of want to bring up very quickly because we're seeing a lot of this being used out there with ARIA and kind of we're all learning to use ARIA together. A lot of use, uh, people think, oh, I'll use ARIA roles equal, equals application because, you know, it's cool. It's an application. It makes me look at a real developer and everything. The problem is you are a real developer and you are responsible for the user when you do this. The, the screen reader enters the same mode as I'm talking about here, the forms mode, the interactive mode. It doesn't use the keyboard. It passes all the keyboard actions straight on through to the web page. So that you have to support all these things. Say you're in a list and user wants to arrow up and down to select something in the list. In your JavaScript, you must implement these actions and connect them to arrows up and arrow down. All the screen reader interaction that users use to you kind of have to be aware of it and implement the part that is relevant to your application. So again, always use you know, HTML native elements when possible. ARIA is to help you when those are not enough. But don't do it for fun. Well, don't do this at home, basically. <laughs> all right, let's do the last two things about screen readers. First about screen reader images. Screen readers are blind as bad. I always like that quote. <laughs> They don't see images, they see the presence, they detect the presence of images. And the first thing they do is to say, hey, what does the author say about this image? So look for the alt tag. So the image presents some information, you have to present that information to the screen reader. If the image is cool, or inappropriate, or visual candy, space graphic, picture of your mother, whatever. Basically, you can tell the screen reader to ignore it by setting alt equals to empty text. Basically, you, you force it to know that the screen reader is not even going to announce the presence of this image to the user. The one exception to this is when the image is part of a link, it's active, the user clicks on it and something happens. Then you must provide some kind of information. Otherwise, the screen reader has to tell the user there's an image that does something, but the only thing it has to fall back on is the file name of the image file, which can be very undescriptive. Usually is actually. And one thing about images, something that unfortunately I'm noticing a lot recently, a lot of images are inserted using CSS background. This is cool for purely like purely decorative images because they're completely hidden from screen readers. They don't see CSS background as content. It's not part of the page. But if it has any kind of information even if, for example, it indicates whether a menu is open or closed, if it like, has color that indicates whether an element is active, screen readers don't pick up any of that, no matter what you do. You can have alt text on it, it doesn't matter. So remember, CSS backgrounds never provide any information through that because it's going to be lost. Decorative, that's fine. All right? Two slides left. We'll be very quickly here. This is the background talk and slide editing. Again, if there are icons that tells you if something is open or closed, for example, if you have like these gear icons that are popular, I believe Google settings, the gear icon open means a submenu pops up. You have to either use hidden text or you have to use the ARIA expanded property to tell the user, hey, if you click on this link, a whole new thing appears on the website. If you don't have anything, 
all of the visual indication how in the world is the screen reader supposed to know when it opens. And, uh, right? This is the page title. We'll skip over it. I've talked about it already. Okay, 20. I, I'll, I will, at the very end, in two or three minutes, I'm going to play you this file that I recorded with the text. Welcome to this summit, so on and so forth. First, with an English speech synthesizer. It's recorded a little bit fast, so it's not very clear. But now, this is usually not a big worry, but this used to be a big problem. We're about to get to our first example. Yes, are ready. Okay. Shortcuts. This is the really cool thing about using screen readers. But this requires your help. So, again, we're still talking about the document. This is what I call the browse mode. I will explain the difference between that and the forms mode in a little bit. But let's concentrate on this. So you have a screen reader, there is a flat document. You can explore it with the arrow keys that goes up and down the line. You know, control right arrow reads the next word. Your screen reader key in the upper row reads the current line, and so on and so forth. You can explore by character just by using the arrow keys. So it just feels kind of like a word document. But now, here are the cool things. It uses the page's semantic structure as a shortcut and to organize and explain to you how the page is built. So this is why it's so important for your semantic structure to kind of reflect the hierarchy of the content of the website. So we'll get into all of these ways in a second. Unfortunately, I have to switch. Alright, so, let's start with headings, that's the classic. And again, the presentation I'm giving now, you don't have to follow all of these things, you will get a copy of the slides if you want, so all these numerous shortcut keys, you don't have to memorize them or worry about them at this point. The general heading scheme is just the H key. So, you open your website with a screen reader, say MEDA, you want to see what is the next heading, press H. Screen reader will jump to the next heading, tell you what it is and what level. So it will say heading level one, heading level two, heading level three. If you want to jump directly to the heading of a specific level, for example, when you are on a site and you're expecting the page to have a main focus, for example, you click on a new story on a website. Now, what you want is to read the new story. You expect that to be the main focal, focal point of the website of the web page that you opened. You usually try, one, to go to the H1 heading because you expect it to be marked as an H1 heading being the focal point of the site. This is very important. So, T will jump between tables if you have tables on the website. And we will get to the tables in a second. You can navigate within tables and I will show you this very shortly, what I'm talking about. L will jump to the next list, so this is ordered, an ordered definition, it doesn't matter. Within the list, you can use the I key to jump between the list elements. F will jump to the next form field. A form field is basically a selection of a bunch of fields, buttons, input fields, checkboxes, radio buttons. All of these are classified as a form field, basically any fields you're likely to have to interact with as a user. So it's very convenient for you to open a website, you expect a form, you expect to have to fill in some information, so you just keep pressing the F key to see what is the next field on the page you have to interact with. If you press Shift with the other the keys I mentioned, you'll go to in reverse order, so, you know, from the top to the bottom. So again, I know this is a bit overwhelming, but you don't have to remember some of these things. But just looking at this, you can go directly to the next visited link, you can go to the unvisited link, you can go between frames, you can go to the next landmark region. We've been talking about AR landmarks a lot here, and they are very neat. Just 
go back to the H1 heading I was talking about before, you might not be able to use an H1 heading to mark the main section of a page for whatever reason. You can do that by just wrapping it in sedative and marking it with role equals main. Then I can go look for the main landmark in my screen reader. This is pretty convenient. I'll show this to you in a second using a typical Google search. And just uh, kind of as a note, there are two things that you do to this information to make it accessible on the website. And uh, does anyone kind of guess what I'm getting at? Table is one way. Another way that I think would be a better is headings, because form fields, under form fields, I have a bunch of things that belong to a form field. So to mark that, for, not initially for the user, form fields should be a heading. Then everything that belongs to a form field should be set, put inside an ordered list. That way it's clear that if I see B for a button, it is part of the form fields. This is very important. I like Let's Have Blue. So, stay away to heading. I don't know, sounds good. So, we're getting close to, I believe, me demoing screen readers a little bit for you guys. But, the last note on headings before I get into that H, the H key jumps to the next heading of any level. But if you look for a heading of a specific level, it's going to keep looking from where you are until it finds that level or its parent heading. So if you start your page with an H2, then you have an H1 further down the page, and then another H2. If you're at the top, you press 2, it's going to tell you lower headings at this level. What it did, it searched and said, oh, so where's the next H2 or something that is H1? Oh, I see an H1, so this is the section of the website I'm looking at. This is not overly important to you for design purposes, but just to be aware of it, if you start testing with headings, you have an H2, H1, and an H2 below it. You press 2 when you go, hey, this reader sucks. It doesn't find the second heading, H2 heading I put in there. What's wrong with this chunk? But uh, it's actually logical. <coughs> All right, so I guess I'll, I'll break this up for a little screen demonstration. Are you guys ready? Multiple 
It honestly, it should be fine. If you think about your content, the most important thing with headings is they should reflect the hierarchy of the content. You can have multiple A's once on the page. There is kind of a best practice only to have one, but I've seen sites that make perfect sense with two or three. Just make sure that the subsection of the H1 should, is marked as I H2 or H3. This is very important. Yeah. For example, say if you have a book, I don't see why the, all the chapters should be H1s, and then chapter 1 1 should be an H2, subchapter 1 1 1 should be an H3, and so forth. Some people say, hey, the title of the book must be an H1, then every chapter needs to be an H2, but then you kind of wasted a whole heading level that you could be using. And to the user, it doesn't make that much of a difference.
Table with six columns and three rows. Column one, column row one. Final. Because the problem with this is what I should be able to do would be to press H and above each table there should be a header with the game, which teams are playing. Either the header or the table should have a caption, more descriptive caption or a summary. Final doesn't really help me very much. But I know this is the third game, but I did my homework. Table with six columns and three rows. Column one, column table with six columns and so, three rows. So here I'm on the right table. So this is what happens if you just, you're at the beginning of the table, you read it with the arrow keys and your typical forms like just using the arrow key. First, second, third, T. Link right, left baron, zero, right baron. What is zero? Hmm. Wonder what team that is. <laughs> yes, this page has not gone through an accessibility certification. Link arrow lineup. Zero, two, one, three. Link right, left baron, zero, right baron. Link Washington. One, one, zero, two. Table left. Based on this, do you guys think you can tell me how many goals Carolina scored in the third period? Probably not, right? <laughs> now, the beauty of the table navigation keys, this table is, for the most part, excessively marked up. So, I can use the control and the alt key with the arrow keys to explore column to the left, column to the right, rows up and down. Let's go back to the table. Interesting. So, 
So again, how do you use semantic markup to basically, how should I be able to find the second result in the search results list? Let's imagine I bundle any of these shortcuts and then do this using an arrow down key. Link plus burger. Link collects as auto packs. Link collects as auto one of red notifications. One. Link collects as auto share. Link collects as auto burger gun bus. Left parent burger dot gun bus and at gmail dot com right parent. Link times. Link times. Link. Link. Welcome to the new page. Find your favorite Google products period. Link. Click the grid to have a look period. This will take a while. <laughs> Not very efficient. Thread was national. So let's check the headings. Check the HP. Search results heading level 2. Ooh, that's interesting. Search results at level 2 heading. News for Threadverse heading level 3 link. News for trackers. Part of the search results. Makes sense. Threadverse apostrophe or link protest apostrophe art test father out capital heading level 3 link. List of one items nesting level 1 period. Heading level 3 link. Threadverse apostrophe. Threadverse apostrophe or link protest apostrophe art test father out capital heading level 3 link. So this is how you navigate my headings. Threadverse dash room. So that's pretty efficient. Let's try the landmarks. The area landmarks. I'm sure you've been talking about the last couple of days. So. In JAWS, this is a semicolon key. In MDA, this is the D key. Navigation region. Navigation region. And for navigation, I would expect kind of a side-wide list of links. Main region. Ah, main region. This is the main part of the page. What is it? Related searches, colon. Link threaders forum. Link threaders games. Link. So, it starts with related searches. Link related searches, colon. Alt tab, task switching list box, alt tab, PowerPoint slide, alt tab, screen resolution, alt tab, JAWS, JAWS. Slow down for the Alt menu, menu, options menu, basics dot 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 to me, voices, basics dot 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 to me, voices sub menu, enter, voice adjustment dot 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 to me, enter, leaving menus, voice adjustment dialog, profile, profile name, tab, profile tab, simplest tab, simplest tab, voice adjust colon combo box, all content tab, voice, rate colon 70, 30, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 10 percent. How about that? <laughs> JAWS, all tabs, drivers, dash. It types, it, it tells me what I'm doing on the keyboard. So that's why you hear all these things. I'll tap. Now I go to the top of the page, control home. Drivers, dash, Google search. Didn't say that. So now I use the semicolon key to explore the region. Navigation region. What is that? Web, link images, link maps, link shopping, <coughs> link news. That's what I expect. Main region. It's the main region. So that should contain the main content of the page. I need a search for truckers, so this should be the search results. Related searches colon, link truckers forum, link truckers games, link. Heading level two search results. This is good. So the main content told me there's a couple of related things, related searches I could be interested in. It's not quite the main thing, so you see it first and then you see a heading that marks the actual search results. List of 11 items. So, because it's in a list, the screen reader tells me how many items I have in the list. 11 items, good. What do I do now? I'm inside a list. The nice thing about lists is you can <coughs> jump between list items using the I, because it's an item. One period, heading level three link news for truckers. New list, one period, heading level three link truckers apostrophe or link protest apostrophe of new list, one period. Interesting, it's a new list. Because the nested Fox list. News dash 12. This actually be a good way they do this. List at nesting level one. This is a problem with nested list with just one item, so it kind of breaks the navigation flow. Two period. So let's jump. List at because it's a nested list, it didn't work for me because it looked for the next list item, saw, wait a minute, there's no other list item. There's a whole new list. So just jump to the top of the page saying, no, you don't have anything. Two period list at so, you have, now you have to use the arrow keys to read like one, one, one list of one. This is where you were before. One period. Link truckers plan to clog capital beltway Friday to protest government apostrophe corruption apostrophe. <laughs> Fox News dash 12 hours ago. Uh -huh. That's today, by the way. <laughs> list at, yeah, you're going to stay here all night, folks. One list at nesting with two period. Heading level three link is truckers apostrophe beltway protest on. Now we're on the second item, so let's try to use the I, I again to get to the third. Three period, heading level three link trucker protest. Nice, of course. 
four period, heading level three link. So I say, oh, I wanted to read number two. All I have to do is to shift back. Right. Three period, heading level three link drug. Two period, heading level three link is drug or zoposter. And as you guys may have noticed, it says heading level two. So I could have done this. Sorry, maybe heading level three. Let's see again. Two period, heading level three link is drug or zoposter. Build wing. So it's heading level three. I could have reached this information now two ways. Using the I shortcut key or the H or three. You could use all three of them. Sometimes semantic markup, markup gets a little bit too much. But this is nice because it gives the user a bit of a choice how to reach the important parts of the website. <coughs> this is very it's quite cool. Alright. Let's see, go back to my part for a bit. You guys in a little break. Well, break from the screen reader. <laughs> Not great for me yet. Also, make sure I'm not running way over time with you guys. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to be quick with this, the rest of this one.
tables. Well, well don't forget to get triples, sorry. I show data tables. What is a problem, and it's kind of partially screen reader problem, is table cells that span multiple rows and columns. It kind of really messes up the navigation order, especially when some cells in the table span two rows and columns, other cells do not. So again, I'm not saying don't use it, but just kind of be aware that it can cause a lot of confusion for users. So if it's possible to avoid that, it's a good thing. There's no how many rows and columns are on a table. They do this for this too. This is very nice about it. Tell the user, and the user expects now knows this is a table of X columns and rows, knows where to look. This is very helpful. So, quick list of other navigational elements. You guys can look at it. this at your own time when you get a copy. Sit down with every DA, play around with them, press the keys, and just kind of see where it takes you. Of course, all of this is dependent depending on you, to provide the semantic navigation elements on the page. This is very important. For a page that, say, has no headers, no tables, no nothing, just data, all of these are completely useless. So this is kind of where you come in, and the people that create the websites and the CMS, this is where it comes in to make sure there's some structure that people can use to navigate your site. Now we go into interactive mode. We don't have much time to cover it, it's a little bit more advanced. But the, the idea is what I kind of showed you before. When you get into a field where you have to provide input, the website expects the input from you. You have to be able to use your keyboard. So the screen reader switches, some do it automatically for some it's a setting. VoiceOver does it a little differently, you have to interact with the field. But you have to basically tell the website, hey, now I'm going to use, the, well, your screen reader. I'm going to use the keyboard to input information to the website. <coughs> Don't take my keyboard input and interpret it as something. It's going straight through to the website. This is important. This helps users fire off keyboard events, unfocus, on blur, all of these things. And if you have, you know, interpreted things like, you know, something tool tips that happen on, on focus, that's cool. If, for example, you want the jump menu, do not initiate it when user is selecting the choice inside the jump menu. So when the focus comes on the moves to the option that the thing the user wants to activate, you have to activate it when the user presses the tab key to tap away from the option field. User has then explored all the options available, has decided I want this, presses tab to move on. This is where you can update. So I'm not going to show an example of this because we're out of time, unfortunately. Maybe in general we can do like a more enhanced version of this or separate. But this is very important. And again, another thing that I kind of want to bring up very quickly because we're seeing a lot of this being used out there with Aria and kind of we're all learning to use Aria together. A lot of use, uh, people think, oh, I'll use Aria roles equal equals application, because, you know, it's cool, it's an application, you need to look at a real developer and everything. The problem is, you are a real developer and you are responsible for the user when you do this. The, the screen reader enters the same mode as I'm talking about here, the forms mode, the interactive mode. It doesn't use the keyboard, it passes all the keyboard actions straight on through to the web page. So that you have to support all these things, say, you're in a list, and user wants to arrow up and down to select something in the list. In your JavaScript, you must implement these actions and connect them to arrows up and arrow down. All the screen reader interaction that user is used to, you kind of have to be aware of it and implement the part that is relevant to your application. So again, always use you know, HTML native elements when possible. Aria is to help you when those are not enough. But don't do it for fun. Well, don't do this at home, basically. <laughs> all right, let's do the last two things about screen readers. First of all, screen reader images. 
screen and there's a blindness of that. I always like that quote. <laughs> they don't see images. They see the presence, they detect the presence of images. And the first thing they do is to say, hey, what does the author say about this image? So look for the alt tag. So the image presents some information, you have to present that information to the screen. If the image is cool or inappropriate or visual candy, space graphic, picture of your mother, whatever. Basically, you can tell the screen editor to ignore it by setting alt equals to empty text. Basically, you, you force it to know that the screen editor is not even going to announce the presence of this image to the user. The one exception to this is when the image is part of a link, it's active, the user clicks on it and something happens. Then you must provide some kind of information. Otherwise, the screen reader has to tell the user there's an image that does something, but the only thing it has to fall back on is the file name of the image file, which can be very undescriptive. Usually is actually. And one thing about images, something that unfortunately I'm noticing a lot recently, a lot of images are inserted using CSS background. This is cool for purely like purely decorative images because they're completely hidden from the screen readers. They don't see CSS background as content. It's not part of the page. But if it has any kind of information, even if, for example, it indicates whether a menu is open or closed, if it like, has column that indicates whether an element is active, screen readers don't pick up any of that, no matter what you do. You can have alt text on it, it doesn't matter. So remember, CSS backgrounds never provide any information through that because it's going to be lost. Decorative, that's fine. All right? Two slides left. We'll be very quickly here. This is the background talk and slide editing. Again, if there are icons that tells you if something is open or closed, for example, if you have like this gear icons that are popular, I believe Google settings, the gear icon open means a submenu pops up. You have to either use hidden text or you have to use the aria expanded property to tell the user, hey, if you click on this link, a whole new thing appears on the website. If you don't have anything other than visual indication, how in the world is the screen reader supposed to know when it opens? And, uh, This is the page title. We'll skip over it. I've talked about it already. Okay, 20. I, I'll, I will, at the very end, in two or three minutes, I'm going to play you this file that I recorded with the text. Welcome to this summit, so on and so forth. First, with an English speech synthesizer. It's a recorded a little bit fast, so it's not very clear. But then I have the same text read by an Icelandic speech synthesizer. Because on Iceland, you could be looking at the page, the language is not defined to the image, so screen reader says, hey, I'm on an Icelandic machine, so I'm going to use Icelandic to read this English text. The results are interesting. So that's going to be the end of my presentation. Last two slides are the do's and don'ts of screen reader usage. This is important. What do screen readers do? They use JavaScript. Don't worry about the no script thing. 98 to 99% of your users have JavaScript enabled. You can hide text for screen readers only by placing it outside the screen. Basically, what's called off screen text. If you need to tell the screen reader user something that is completely obvious from a visual perspective, you can do this. For example, you can say if a link is selected because it has a kind of selected icon, you can put like a hidden text inside the link text that says selected. This is cool, and uh, it's useful sometimes. You shouldn't overuse it, but it's a nice technique to be aware of. And yes, in, in forms mode, interactive mode, <coughs> screen readers fire keyboard events. And finally, this is important, what they do not do. They do not interpret images. They can't see an image, not yet. JAWS is beginning to experiment, JAWS and MDA, with OCR and object recognition. And I hope I can come here in three years and say, hey, images are cool. Screen readers know what they are. We're getting close. They do not simulate the mouse. They do in a very limited capacity and it's very unreliable. But for example, if you have a div with an on-click, 
um, screen reader is not going to even recognize that as an actionable item. So you have to be very careful about that. A screen reader user is a keyboard only user. And just to make sure, if, you want, if you're hiding something using CSS, you want something to be available to screen readers, some text that you're hiding from sighted users, do not use display map because that hides stuff from everybody. Background images. I've just been seeing a lot of this problem pop up in various sites we've been auditing lately. It's very hard for me to detect this problem because my screen reader doesn't even tell me it's there. So I have to like dig through the CSS line by line. It's time consuming, it's annoying, so I wish you just you as a community will stop it. Make my life much easier. <laughs> Alright, so how about we uh, wrap this up. I'll play you this one audio file of the text. Can you maybe bring it back up? Uh, the audio? No, the, the, the slide. So you guys can see the text. It's about... <clears throat> yeah, it's like, welcome to the jQuery Summit, and so on and so forth. So again, I do apologize. Um, I had to ask a friend of mine to record this for me. I didn't have the software installed. So he recorded this a little bit fast. So you should be able to see this text that the screen editor is reading. You can hear, you can kind of understand the English thing. And the second part is the Icelandic voice reading the English text. Listen for that. Typical interactive stuff for I was going to try this and it worked this morning, of course. You guys know how that is. Can I try it over this something else? This might not work. Windows Media Player, let's try that. I had to put the number six in there because the Icelandic version is sex and the one the sexy presentation. So. <laughs> <laughs> Alright guys, get back to me with any questions, anything you would like to have seen in this, anything we can improve, and I'd be happy to improve and get back to you and help you out. Don't be scared of screen readers, install them, play with them, use these shortcuts, and you can you know, email me and contact us or any screen reader users if you have any issues or questions. So, fire away, enjoy the rest of the day.